Hello, uh, thank you very much for joining me. I'm Elias Munsha. I'm coming live from Calgary, Alberta in Canada. Um, uh, just a few hours ago, look at this, this world-class team. You know, we've just beaten the champions. So if a team beats a champion, it means it's a, it's a double champion, okay? <laughs> so Arsenal, Arsenal are the world champions as far as I'm concerned, okay? So that was, that was a great game. I hope you, all of you enjoyed. So Liverpool has been severely beaten. It was, it was not even a contest. I think Liverpool should have given up within 10 minutes of the game to say, no, let's give this trophy to Arsenal because only Arsenal was, was playing uh, very, very well, okay? So at Wembley, I think, I think Wembley should become an, uh, another Arsenal stadium. What do you think? You know, because Arsenal is always winning. So here we are. Okay, please spread the word around as much as you can, because today I want to talk to the youth of Zambia. Now, I know that this is about 21.30, and so some, some of you youths are sleeping, but I would want to invite you to be awake so that we can have a discussion about some of the things that have happened here. Um, the reason why I want to talk to the youth of Zambia is because Zambia has a very long history. And if we miss this history, we are not going to learn the lessons. Very important. We are not going to learn the lessons. Now, of course, some of the people are going to disagree with me, and it is okay to disagree with me. And in fact, some are, uh, were part of the Kaunda government, and so they really swear and stand by the things that used to happen during the Kaunda regime. But I want to just give my side of how I, I understood these things over the years. And most of you, particularly those that were born in the late 80s and early 90s, you may not relate to some of the things that have been happening regarding privatization. So I want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about that in order for us to uh, send this message and teach the young people. Now, most of you are very clear about what happened at independence in 1964. To cut a very long story short, in 1964, on 24th October, Zambia became an independent country. It became an independent nation. And the first president of Zambia, of course, was Kenneth Kaunda. At independence, Zambia was a what we call a free enterprise country. Free enterprise means that much of the industry were in private hands. Zambia was a democracy in 1964. It was a multi-party democracy in the sense that it had several parties in the country and Kenneth Kaunda became its first president. However, shortly after independence, Kenneth Kaunda embarked on a program known as Zambianization. Zambianization was basically to transfer the Zambian economy from the hands of foreigners into the hands of Zambians. But it was not just about transferring the economy, it was also about transferring the human resource from foreigners. By foreigners, it meant white people. Moving, moving or kicking out white people so that Zambians, black Zambians, and sometimes other non-black Zambians as well, to become uh, the, the drivers of the Zambian economy. Uh, that system worked to an extent, okay? But it did not work as it was env uh, envisaged or as it was planned. There were several issues with that system. Uh, several issues were that, you see, at independence, Kenneth Kaunda wanted to keep the whites so that the whites begin transferring the resources, the, the know-how, the knowledge, the management experience, until we could have blacks that were equipped enough to be able to run the economy. The fact that you are politically independent does not mean that you have everything in tow and you know everything that is needed. That is what happened in the 60s. However, due to politics, due to the realities of politics, of course, Kaunda tried to accelerate the Zambianization program even before we had enough graduates to be able to, 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 to guide all these industries that was coming. 
uh, all this um, opportunity that was coming before we could train people. Those people were needed to become managers and drivers of the industries. I'm not trying to say that that was a wrong program. All I am saying is that the reality was that we may not have been prepared to assume that role of becoming drivers of the industries that were disposed uh, before us. And politics, of course, the need for um, our, our economy to transition into black hands was very huge. And so I sympathize with Kenneth Kaunda and a group of his uh, ministers who felt that they needed to do what they had to do to begin bringing visibility of black people into the industry. However, as something else happened. The 60s were very difficult for politics in Zambia. The reason was due to what is known as tribalism. Now, you think that tribalism is something very new. No, even in the 60s, Kaunda was also struggling with tribalism. So Kenneth Kaunda thought that the best way that he could resolve this problem was to try and ban all other political parties in Zambia and maintain the United National Independence Party as the only party. He felt that when he does that, there's going to be some level of unity in Zambia. He was very concerned that there was a Tonga, uh, 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 Eastern divide, there was a Bemba, Lozi divide, and so he did not want that, okay? So he then proposed that all other parties are going to be banned and we are going to have only one party in, in power. Kenneth Kaunda called it the one party participatory democracy that happened in about 1972. Now, industries in Zambian hands, one party participatory democracy, the consequence of doing these two things at the same time was dire. The problem was that as you were Zambianizing and as you were driving, moving the country from, um, uh, uh, as you were Zambianizing and moving the country to, an, to a one party participatory democracy, the role of cadres was going to be much more pronounced than previously. It meant then that for jobs, you were going to look more on party affiliation and faithfulness to the ruling party than academic or professional merit. That is one of the criticisms that we have of the one party state. Now, we think that the current level of cadres are very bad. But when we look back to the 70s and the 80s, the level of cadreism was pretty, was pretty strong, okay? In, in those days, um, and, and in fact, we were under a state of emergency where even if, 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 if in, 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 in communities, it was the ruling party that was presiding over communities. When you receive a visitor from the village, you needed to, to notify the chairman of the party that you are uh, uh, visitors, from, visitors from the village. It was a very tightly controlled society. Now, we are not trying to blame Kenneth Kaunda. All that we are trying to do here is to give you a story. And I know there are several other people who have a different story about what used to happen during the Kenneth Kaunda regime. Okay. Now, Zambianization also meant then that all the industries that were in private hands were going to be transitioned so that they become state enterprises. So Kenneth Kaunda bought off all the companies, Lever Brothers, he bought it off. The mining, they bought it off. And the, all of them became state companies. This is where the term parastatal comes from. They became parastatal companies. Kenneth Kaunda then went on a very ambitious program to industrialize Zambia. In industrializing Zambia, what he meant was that he was going to have um, a key industries in every province. In Winilunga, he had the pineapple processing plant. In Mansa, we had the Mansa batteries, which was mining um, uh, magnesium and then making batteries. In Livingstone, he assembled a very ambitious program of, mot of, of automotive um, uh, things. In Mongo, in several parts of the country, he did that. Those were known as parastatal companies. Zesco and several other uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. However, there are several realities that we needed to face. 
copper uh, 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 prices in the 70s went down. It added a lot more pressure on the Zambian economy. What else happened? Um, um, there was war in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, just our neighbor Zimbabwe. We look at Zimbabwe and we think what a wonderful country it was. But there was war there in the 70s. All these were realities that were putting pressure on the industries in Zambia. But the problem was that because Zambia now had become a one-party participatory democracy, jobs were not based on professional or academic merit. They were now based on party affiliation. Therefore, patronage became a very, very important consideration for appointment into positions. That is what defined the one party state. Party affiliation. Who were you de uh, uh, determined was, was a higher consideration than the skills that you could bring to the job. The other thing was, of course, tribal balancing. It was very important to Kaunda that all these parastatal chiefs were coming from different tribes. That is, of course, a plus, but it had its own negative connotations. And so you had universities where registrars were, were like grade seven uh, uh, people or grade nine. You had uh, companies where the managing director did not have degrees. Quite all right. There were some that had degrees, but others, most of them did not. So there was no professionalization of our parastatal companies. And of course, due to the politics, Kaunda could not just keep all these parastatals going. The other challenge was that in order for the states to operate, it needs taxes. States, where do states uh, 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 take the money from, get the money from? They get all this money from taxes. And so if you have a very small uh, uh, base from which to tax in order for the state to have money, but you have so many companies that you must pay workers, that model is not going to be sustainable, unfortunately. Okay? So if, for example, you have so many parastatal companies, 100 parastatal companies, and all these workers are on government payroll, you must have a lot more money in order for you to be able to pay all these people. And because it's parastatal companies, the problem was profit was not important anymore. It was politics. And so as long as these workers are paid, as long as these workers are happy, as long as Kenneth Kaunda somehow finds or prints money to pay these workers, that was a much higher consideration than, than profit. Let's take Zambia Airways, for example. Zambia Airways did not fail because it did not have great uh, pilots or it did not fail because it, not, it did not have enough assets. Zambia Airways failed because of business. Again, because it was a one party state, it meant that party officials should be given preference. And in fact, some flights that were starting from Lusaka to London were full of people at half price or some people that had not even paid for the tickets. As a result of that, Zambia Airways could not turn a profit. Now, it wasn't because there was no business. It wasn't because it could not make money. It was simply because there was too much politics in companies, all right? In the 70s, by the late 80s, the business climate was difficult whatever we were producing in Zambia could not be enough to feed ourselves as a country so that we could generate income to pay taxes and sustain an economy. Copper prices were under pressure. The industries themselves, they were all based on political patronage. Zambian engineers, Zambian educated, intelligent people that could make things happen could not do that anymore because the ward chairman had much more power than directors, than the educated people, than the intelligentsia of our country. This is what happened. As a result of this pressure, Kenneth Kaunda could not generate enough income to pay all these workers. There was an APRO within the labor movement. ZCTU, of course, capitalized on that, leading to 1990, 1989 and 1990, and other riots that happened due to the fact that there was no enough millimeter in Zambia, okay? 
That is what led now to our transition from Kaunda's one party state to a democracy in the 1990s. However, several other realities should be, should be looked at here. South Africa had just left apartheid. The South African industry was now going to open up. And guess what? South Africa was going to now want to have the ambition of reaching into uh, the SADC region, which means the loss-making industries in Zambia were already at a huge disadvantage. If you were making cooking oil in Indola, you would be competing with an open South African industry that is going to make that was making oil cheaply and could deliver to the to the rest of of, of SADC. Those were some of the pressures. China was also rising. Mm -hmm. Russia and the USSR, the Soviet bloc, was also collapsing during that time. As a result, a model where the state continues to operate industries in Zambia became unsustainable and unworkable. That is just the reality. There is no way that we were going to keep our industries Kaunda's parastatal industries in Zambia, the pressure was just too much. That's why after 1991, after Frederick Chiluva won, there was clear consensus that in order to bring Zambia back to prosperity, it was important to privatize these parastatal companies. Now, what does it mean to, to privatize? It meant that the state was going to get rid of some of these companies and sell them into private hands. The reason why they are being sold into private hands was that those private companies, they begin to capitalize those industries. They begin looking and partnering with other international partners. They begin looking down to Zimbabwe, to South Africa, so that these companies can work together. They begin looking at the international market and international opportunities. That was why they went towards privatization. The mines, quite all right, the mines were there. And most of them, by, by late 1990s, because the, the machinery had not been um, uh, repaired in a very, very long time, there was need for fresh funds into all those mines. Now, where were all those funds going to come from? Our debt burden was huge, between five to 10 billion. Numbers are, are, are inconsistent at the moment. So you required a lot of money to capitalize them. Then came the idea of privatization. It was going to be a very difficult and controversial thing to do. The reason why privatization was going to be difficult was that under the counter regime, we were used to having the state become the owner of all these companies. Even if they were making losses, the state would still continue subsidizing those industries. But the model could not work. The model could not work not because we were incapable. The model could not work because of the realities of politics. That's why the same Zambians, the same Zambian engineers who have built roads in Botswana, who have been hired in South Africa, who have worked excellently in Namibia, who have done wonders internationally. They could not do it in their own country. The reason was the word chairman had more power over all these educated professionals. And so what is the biggest problem with the parastatal model? It is the model where politics determine everything else that the parastatals are going to do. Let's take the Zambia Daily Mail, for example, or the Times of Zambia. These two companies are insolvent. They cannot pay their debts. They, 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 they survive by the taxpayers. Now, imagine having a hundred Times of Zambia businesses across the country. The tax base would be small. You have to borrow billions in order to continue paying the workers. And that's exactly what used to happen in the 70s and in the 80s. That model could not work. Of course, the second model could be to, 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 to have parastatals, but divorce the government from, from these companies. That is the thing that we have failed. We failed under Kaunda. 
it cannot work. The reason is that politics always wins over businesses. And that's why Frederick Chiloga and his group of magicians, they had to come up with, with a solution here. The solution was to privatize, to sell most of these companies over into private hands so that wealth can begin to be generated properly by private hands so that the state begins doing what? Taxing all these, all these resources. I'm not saying that Chiluba did it very well. There, there are a lot of lessons that we need to learn about what happened during that time. There is this thing that we think that Chiluba was a very ambitious privatizer. According to Guy Scott, and I do have the Guy Scott book. Let me just uh, get it. This is the Guy Scott book. It's known as Adventures in Zambian Politics, a story in black and white. Um, uh, somewhere here, Guy Scott actually says that Chiluba was not an ambitious privatizer. He was a very cautious privatizer. So according to Guy Scott, Guy Scott wanted Chiluba to be much more ambitious in his privatization program. And Guy Scott is concerned that Chiluba was not as ambitious. One of the examples that Guy Scott uses is a company known as the Cafue Consortium. Consortium. The Cafue Consortium. The Cafue Consortium was going to be this super big company that was going to come and invest in our mining industry. Chiluba was not willing to uh, allow them to come in. But Guy Scott feels like the Cafue Consortium should have been allowed to come and, 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 and invest in Zambia. Anyway, um, at least from Guy Scott's perspective, and Guy Scott really has no kind words for Chiluba, but at least he paints a picture that Frederick Chiluba was much more cautious, was much more reluctant. But the realities of the day were such that if they did not make the kind of decisions that they made, Zambia was going to continue accruing more debt. And if you have uh, no, no, nowhere to borrow, you know what would happen? You will continue printing. And very quickly, the Zambian economy was going to continue the downward spiral of the Kaunda regime. Difficult decisions had to be made. And one of these decisions was to try to take government out of business so that government concentrates on bring, coming up with policies that are going to help our country develop. And that's why they privatized some of the companies. They sold them out. They sold these companies. And in those days, we had, uh, we had great, great ministers. Emmanuel Okasonde. He was the first uh, finance minister. And, and we had uh, people like Ronald Penza, very, very outward and forward-looking entrepreneurs who knew that the answer to the problems that we were having at that time was to try to get politics and the state out of these corporations. To date, the consequences of those decisions are there for us to, to feel. There are so many people from my father's age who were working for all these companies and those and 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 a lot to date have something you know it has left a very bitter uh, 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 test in their mouths. Of course, there was no way that that program was going to be uh, done without having a few uh, uh, problems here and there. But they accomplished something. Frederick Chiluba and his government they accomplished something. What did they accomplish? they managed to reorient the engine of our economy from an economy that looks to the government to an economy that tries to get people to go into business and do business. That by far is the greatest achievement that Frederick Chiloa did and his group of, of, of magicians. I call them magicians. For example, we used to have a company known as the United Bus Company of Zambia, UBZ. It was the only company that had the, the buses to take us to various parts of the country. Frederick Chiluba liquidated that company after they had liquidated that company. They, they then liberalized the transport sector. Within a few years, we now had buses moving from town to town. You can look at it and think that was very small, but it was huge. At least the economy can keep going. And most importantly, the state was not going to be determining 
which UBZ bus is going to be on the road and which UBZ bus is not going to be on the road. The other thing that the Chiluba government did was to sell houses. So all these houses that belonged to the councils, belonged to the government, Chiluba empowered the people of Zambia directly. Some of the houses were being sold for 10 kwacha, 10,000 kwacha. You know, my big father, Batata Mkalamba, Kuchawanyama, Nawobene, became one of the beneficiaries of that. And my, my, my cousins, my brothers, and all those, they grew up at least in a house in Kuchawanyama, that they bought from Frederick Chiluba at 10 kwacha. There are some people who got lucky and they bought bigger houses. They bought bigger houses. It was known as empowerment. Through that, we could see that the Zambian economy was in the right trajectory. Were there any issues? Yes, of course, the issues were there. Were there some corruption? Some people say Frederick Chiluba was corrupt, but at least the economy opened up. We began competing. We began interacting with South Africans. We began interacting with, the, with Zimbabweans. We opened up some parts of, of in, in agriculture. Okay? Is this something that should have been done better? Of course, there, there will always be things that are going to be done and, and wished uh, uh, were done. But at least during that regime, something happened. Now, after Chiluba left power, Levi Mwanawasa came on. During that time, the 2000s, something very important was happening internationally. What was happening was Africans started guilting whites into the debt burden that they had. So the, 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 the whites were guilty. And as a result of the Jubilee campaign of the year 2000, most of the institutions where Zambia was borrowing money from decided to forgive Zambia's debts. It was in billions of dollars between five to $10 billion. Suddenly, the money that we were owing from Kaunda to Chiluba was now wiped clean as a result of the Jubilee campaigns that were done. As a result of that, Mwanawasa could easily, very, very easily now begin building, rebuilding this economy. And he did try his best. With very little uh, debts to, to pay, it meant then that when they tax the citizens of Zambia, they are going to have much more money in the coffers because they are not using half of it to pay and save his debts. That is how Mwanawasa now managed to at least stabilize, greatly stabilize our economy. And then he had a very ambitious um, a minister of, of, of finance known as Ngandu Magande. Mwanawasa went and fished Ngandu Magande from international multilateral institutions where this great son of the soil was doing his service. Mwanawasa called him and told him, Ngandu Magande, you are going to become Minister of Finance. Ngandu Magande and Mwanawasa, one of the most interesting things with Ngandu Magande and Mwanawasa, when they were working on infrastructure development, they were making it very clear that infrastructure development is going to be directed at sectors that are going to produce for Zambia. That is, that is, that is where Magande was. For example, one of the chiefs told Magande to say, build a road in my chiefdom. Ngandu Magande answered and said, we are not going to build a road in a chiefdom because we want to redirect infrastructure development into sectors that are actually productive. They tried to invest in, 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 in roads in the urban areas. They tried to invest in, um, uh, in infrastructure that is going to, 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 to help the economy. And they helped stabilize um, uh, the economy quite a bit. But the effects were still there. Beginning from the structural adjustment programs of Chiluba, uh, the privatization and all that, so the pain for Zambians was still there. But while the ordinary Zambians were still feeling pain, the fundamentals of, Zambian, uh, of the Zambian economy were doing extremely well. We were on the right trajectory until Mwanawasa, of course, passed away. 
Ropia Banda came on. Ropia Banda's fundamentals were also holding up very well because they, we did not have that burden of debts anymore. The government was no longer taking care of parastato companies. So Rupia Banda could easily um, uh, concentrate on just building the fundamentals of our economy. They built reserves to about $2.5 billion. When Rupia Banda was leaving office in 2011, there was about $2.5 billion in the, um, in the Bank of Zambia from the reserves. Okay. But of course, the pain of the ordinary people was there. People were, were struggling. They felt like this thing was not working for them. But at least money started appearing in the economy. People, exporters in Zambia and importers in Zambia were busy. Of course, there were challenges with the copper mines and everything else, but at least the fundamentals were holding just fine. Something happened in 2011. All the restraints with um, uh, infrastructure spending were taken out in 2011 and we borrowed. Now, there are no records. Between 2011 and presently, we borrowed almost $15 billion more, which means whatever things that Chiluba tried to build, whatever things Monawasa tried to build, whatever things that Rupia Banda tried to build, in 10 years, from 2011 to the present, we squandered the 2.5 billion that uh, uh, Rupia Banda left. After squandering that money, we went on to borrow billions more. That's exactly what has happened in our, in our country. Now, where did we borrow all these billions? You see, Kaunda's debts were mostly from whites. Chiluba's debts were also from whites. Uh, 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 Levi Monawasa and Rupia Banda, that was the time of great African prosperity, great African century, our debts were being forgiven, and so, and so we could get away with it. From 2011, we found a new person to lend us money, China. Now, you see, with whites, we could easily tell them, hey, guys, you are the ones who colonized us. So these two billion that you, 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 you lent us and you want it back, we are not going to give it to you because you are our colonizers. And whites are going to feel guilty and we will take them on a guilty trip and it will be over and they'll forgive that debt. Not with China. So from 2011 to the, to, to the present, 15 billion more dollars in debt. Not only that, what it means when we borrow so heavily as a country that is just trying to build its economy. The consequences are that we will need more money to begin paying back the money that we are borrowing. There is no way out. You can't even try to renegotiate with any person to say, come on, no, no, no. As far as the Chinese are concerned, that's what they do. They give you $2 billion for very huge, useless projects. Let me give you an example of one project. The Kenneth Kaunda International Airport. They gave you, they gave us how much? Is it a billion to build that airport? Of course, almost half of it was stolen, right? So if you are trying to say you are trying to build an economy, how does the, an airport become a priority? Let's talk about roads. What has happened to the roads? Let's talk about so many other infrastructure projects. This is the problem. You see, I have pains here. Infrastructure development without dealing with the fundamentals of development are useless. It's like having so many pens. If you buy so many pens, but you don't have ink in the pens, there is no development that is going to bring. So they went and have borrowed so many billions of dollars to build white elephants across the country. These white elephants are not going to help with the development of our economy. They are like so many pens that have no ink on, in them. They are very beautiful to see, but they are basically useless because you can't write with them. If this is just about having so many pens that people are going to be admiring, then let it be. But in order for us to build an economy that brings prosperity to ordinary Zambians, we've got to take build on the Chiluba model. Build on Manawasa's discipline, build on Rupia Banda's discipline, so that 
once those fundamentals are in place, it will become very easy to bring prosperity to our country. But we have concentrated on having all these pens without the fundamentals of the economy. You can build a thousand hospitals across the country, but if you cannot have enough taxes to pay the nurses, then those hospitals are going to be white elephants. And in no time, what will happen to those hospitals? They are going to be taken by the earth because the earth reclaims all these buildings. That's why what is important is for a government that is very well disciplined. But unfortunately, what happened after 2011 lacked discipline. Now, there, there is a lot that can be said about President Sata. Some say that he had very good ideas because even if he was populist, Sata was quite capitalist. Okay, make no mistake, many people think that Michael Sata was a very good uh, 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 communist or socialist. No, Michael Sata's um, ideas were quite populist, but in practice, he was a very, very consummate uh, entrepreneur. Very, very consummate entrepreneur. And so there is this theory, this theory that a few years into his presidency, he became sick. And so it was other people that were determining uh, the borrowing and everything. Maybe we can give him a benefit of doubt. But after, 20, after 2015 and 2016, we went back to China, borrowed more, built a lot of white elephants that have not helped with our economy. Now, something happens. After President Lungu fails to move this economy further, after he builds so many pens without ink, there is no longer money in our economy. We have no reserves. It has all been squandered. We have borrowed so many billions from China and China is not like Bazungu, which we can guilt into forgiving our debts. It can't work like that. As a matter of fact, most of the contracts for those debts that we signed as a country, some of it we understand were in Chinese and it had a lot of conditions such as making some of the parasitos that we have currently as sureties for those debts. If China wants, they are going to come and they are going to come for the little remaining parasitos that we have left. That is just the reality. Now, President Lungu has failed. Now, after he fails, he then begins making up things. He wants somebody to blame for his failure. Now, he's not going to blame Chiluba because Chiluba is dead. He's not going to blame Wanawasa. He's not going, going to blame Sata. So he comes up with lies and begins directing a blame to someone. Now, I have no issues with PF cadres. PF cadres are my fellow cadres. I'm probably a cadre myself. They are my brothers and they are my sisters. What I say is not directed at PF cadres. It is not directed at my people in Ruapula province who overwhelmingly still support the Patriotic Front. My beef is with the leadership of the Patriotic Front, with President Lungu and a group of their leaders who have no regard for the ordinary people of Zambia. Those are the people that I talk about. That is where I direct my anger because our country can do better. Our country can do so much, but it is limited because of the limited vision of its leader, its president. A president who was not inspired and built on the success of his predecessors. A president who has gone on to borrow billions and billions of dollars to build pens without ink. And then he takes good pictures of these pens he says they are so nice, they are so wonderful, but the pens cannot try it. You have no money to pay nurses or to pay doctors. It is not enough to just take pictures of the clinic that you built in Shangombo. The clinic in Shangombo only becomes valuable if at all you can send doctors and nurses there to help our people. Years after borrowing, we are still experiencing load shedding. How can we, 
A country that is blessed with natural resources and water from the Luapula River to the River Chambishi to the Zambezi. How can we as a country that is so much blessed with all these resources have no electricity? It does not make sense. And now they're just taking pictures of all these white elephants that they have built. That is where the issue is. Now, the economy is dwindling in Zambia. We have very big fundamental economic issues. They've tried to go to the IMF. The IMF is asking them one simple question. Be transparent about how much money you have borrowed from China. They cannot tell us. This cabinet has gone on to borrow and borrow without telling parliament, because when you tell parliament, it's a public record. They've not told parliament how much they have borrowed. As a result, the World Bank and the IMF are saying, people, just give us an idea, because when you give us an idea, we can see how we can help you. It's going to be another painful process. You see, when you are lacking leadership, you cannot build on the strengths of the past. You begin repeating the same things. So instead of us going through the pain of the 90s under Chilova, we are going in 2020, go back to those pains of 1990, which was pretty unnecessary. So the IMF are saying, show us where the wound is. Show us how deep you have borrowed so that we can see how we can help you. They can't do that. Now, because politics is catching up with them, the people of Zambia are saying, no, you are not doing anything to help us. They've seen how the kwacha has doubled in 10 years, lost its value by 200% in 10 years. They have seen how their own sick people in hospitals are going to hospitals without drugs. They're seeing how this president is moving from province to province, starting all these white elephants. They're seeing how they are spending so much money on roads where they're not durable roads. These are roads I have covered. Where they started from. And Zambians are like, we need, we need something to change here because the president, and it's the president, again, it is the president. He's not doing anything. He's not doing enough. He has no clue. Now, so then they now want to find somebody to blame and guess who that somebody is. It is the person who is aspiring to lead our country. I'm not telling you to vote for HH. I don't even know HH, but I've seen him on pictures. He looks good. So instead of focusing on trying to resolve our current problems, they have now found somebody to blame for their incompetence. Shiluba is definitely not there, so he's not a candidate. So they found suddenly HH, and they're saying that it is HH who sold the mines. The people of Zambia must stand together and reject the patriotic front lies again. It's not the cutters. You cutters are like me. You are me. I am you. We are one together. We are suffering together with the cadres. It is the leaders. It is the patriotic front that is stealing what belongs to you as Zambians and fellow cadres. It is President Lungu and his group of, 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 of very close people that are stealing, borrowing, and mismanaging this economy. I have no problems with my relatives that support the patriotic front, but I have problems with the patriotic front party and its top leaders who are only bent on stealing and stealing and stealing some more. And now because they have no program, they want to heap it all on HH. I've been told that I should avoid trying to speak in a lot of Bemba. Nomba, munje leleko, kambonfie kwe chibemba. Chimono kwe wa chabantu bambibanya. 
Elo no mbabaya sendama fi batu iko waka yele ate unyele bamutu iko bamutu ama fi Eo batu iko ate unyele e file chitika Abe bile mbushi ni bambi badi mbushi chije babe kata elo ba senda mala ya mbushi ba ya mushinga e church at ni e church e bile e file chitika Pantu kwena, iwe ni waboka teka. Chiruba abo mbesha, achita reorient economy ya chalo. Abena mwana wansi, nko ngule shonse, clean slate. Elo nomba waisapo, chidia waisapo, you are not leading the people. Iwe cholefu wa yafie kuiva. Ala na abeva. Ezo kanchi na ndaka ino mba, bale foresh ya fempi echi foresh, foresh, panduku iba, badi iba. Nomba, ina nshire ilaka na vena Zambia iyo. Nshire ilaka na makada zwaba PF, amakada zwaba PF bantu bandi. Bantu di mbina inewe ni nebo kata, teti njishive. Tuli vena Zambia konse. Obu wafia nkwete na vo, ni valungu na vapululu shawo. Talungu nawa, 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 eva le yivechi umachachalo. Nga kutituwa chula shani, ekonomi ya di yesuka, wino, wino. Inko ngole, mudi mwanawasa, badi tuwele le nko ngole, badi tuwele le nko ngole hawa sungu. Abati, let this poor country start afresh. Tuwa tampa kono kuchitapiu, na mari zevz rupia banda asha. Pari basa tatatu walande sana. Tipari tuwele. Nomba ili yu ababadi po. Nomba kufuwa yu waku vepesha. Baya senda na vantu bambia tiyo mguwai aleni nomba. Sonteni minwe pari HH. Ni HH wa hivide. Nomba umundu usha chitapo serve in any government. Haka inde hichilema. Ta chitapo serve in any government. Kuti ba tuweba shane at ewa iwechu machachalo and is the one who is responsible for our current situation. Kaidi mweba leteka, muambo usonta umbi, muanya, elu nombo muaya mushingama fi, ateo nyele. Na ifwe tusumi nemu yugobo fi, Ati yo chachi ne, ni yaka inde, ayama fi, yako haka inde, tusumi ne. Kwa chita tutonto onkanya. Mweba leo mfuwa manone, ni mwemwe, kama manone, indekesho mwle kongo la, ni mwe. Obu shukuwa leo wati ni yaka inde, na ifo tusumi ne. Mweba ushi, mwebe na luwakula, kumilenge, na kumuansa kwa umbwe, na kumansa, umfweni. Abe, bilechu, machachalo, niba lungu, eba, kabwa, la, la, ebe, bile. Na plani, tabako, ete, nomba, kuwe, pesho, mundu. Eo, ba, pesho, eo, ba, tuika. Imbeke, ti, yama, fi, ati, ni, uwe. Nga kuti tuwasumi na shaya ni uyuna mayo, uwa apena. Aya na pa radio, aya na leta na pepa refi ya ufi, ukweba ati uwa shitishe chini ya chini ya chechi. Ushe kwena. Ababa mayo ba na wako, batu ntulufi kwino kwino. Eba adiba minister of finance. Ili ufi mofi mofi ale shitiko. Ushepo inanga chakuti la HH adiva po, adiva po, ino nshita, ngepo adi. Apo traffic offense kumongu ya chitike kujabali mulo nga di treason. E choka nshita tuwa sumine ubufi po wa patriotic front. Eno napali wa patriotic front, shire landa pama members, yo, mwema members, mulibe na Zambia vanandi, imo mulibe na Zambia vanandi. Nisha amipata yo, mwe makadazi, nisha amipata. Nde milandi lako. Nangu muntu ke, nde ni muende la ndi lako. Nde milidi la, ni muende lila. 
ni mwende chudira. Okweba ati obubu teko wawa alongo tefyo. Wateke echalo. No mba tuika lefya ati yo mkwa hiko mkanie ni pokula vepe show mundu. Usha wako mgavamendu. Omu inefi wa londoro rafi wako vati nendi mutonga. Ido na afieru efi na afieru ene ngombe. Ero na saa panga kutu piyo tu no no fire fire na wika mungombe. Na muvidimi. Na mudi land. Ero nomba naza sangati ni nguina. Pantu e mupa shitu walefu wa yoku mona. Ido chiruwa shiti shefi ndu fiyonze fiyo. When Chilwa privatized the country, that is the kind of entrepreneurship that we wanted to see. And we see it in, uh, in Mr. Mr. Hichilema. He took the little money that he made out of it. And it was not only Hichilema who was working in those days. Several law firms, Kanyebe. In Zambia, Zambian lawyers were about 200 or 300 at that time. There was no business law in Zambia. The reason was there were no industries in Zambia that were in private hands. There was no business law. The first business law firm in Zambia is Copas. Chairman of the MMD. Elias Pimo Senior, Elias Pimo Junior, ni lawyer. E law firm ya kwe ilia. Iyo bata mpiro kwa wano mbata mpe to help the people of Zambia to navigate through the privatization process. Elias Pimo Junior made some money out of it. Even today, he's comfortable. And he has, he has a law firm that he has built a very big, important business law firm in Zambia. Because of privatization, because of the opportunities that were there for the people that were, that were there. Others, they were also consultants, lawyers. No, but they did not invest that money, no. They took that money and they started um, uh, uh, drinking with it and, 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 and doing whatever they did. You know, so, so they took that money and they, they spent it. That's what I read from the NDC. I don't know, but the NDC are saying that Balungu Ben was one of the consultants during that time, made some money. And instead of uh, being like HH or like Elias Chipimo, he took that money and he spent it on nightclubs. That's what the NDC are saying. I'm not, I'm not the one who is making up this. So number four, for people in their right minds to say that we are in this misery because of HH is not fair. In Ndanti la kofi abandu. Iliyo wale titikisha lungu, ndamula ndina kwa tiyo wapa mwa mtitikisha. Nomba wapa mwale titikisha haka imbe hichilema. Nga tamule mufuaya, landeni fete tamule mufuaya. Yo, uku chinoko la wepo obo fi. That is, that is the only thing. With tribalism, other than foundation. Which other people made, made, made money during privatization? A lot. A lot of professionals. During privatization, what it meant was that there was going to be professionalization. Ama lawyers were going to be professionals and they'll be paying, paid accordingly. Ama accountants, they'll be professionals. They'll be paid accordingly. Takua you are just an accountant of a company because you belong to the ruling party. No, they sent all these people back to school. That is what happened during the privatization. The administrative state started to grow and expanding. NAPSA was established. Workers' Compensation Board was established. Several other agencies of the state started growing and developing. And Zambia suddenly started seeing at least some level of prosperity. There was still some suffering. True. I grew up in Chiwempala in the 90s. I saw with my very own eyes the kind of struggle that we had to go through.
with an aunt who was a marketeer at Chuempala Market. I saw it. But the fundamentals were there. We were now a democratic country up to the point where we are today. Okay. Right. So, 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 is it true that uh, they, they, these consultants may have done some? Yes, of course. If you want to find a skeleton, you will find it on either Elas Pimo Jr. Of course, you may find it. I don't know. On Ed Galungu, of course, you may find it because he was one of the consultants or one of the lawyers who was acting for some of these companies. On HH, I don't know. You can find it. Because of all this, what happened in the 90s? No. It is the PF that are stealing now. It is the PF that are stealing now. That is where the issue is. Now. Not my industry is to share a Now. Those are the kind of problems that we have now. We need a leader that is going to build on what his predecessors did, not a leader who, when he fails, uh, that is not the kind of thing that we need for development in Zambia. In what capacity can a private citizen? Of course, it's a lie. Ebet Biliga, it's a lie. Mulem Pangabamu, Shabarefoya, but we KHH zone. Of course, that's exactly what they've done. And now they are using they they are using this woman. And forgive my language, she is saying some very useless and divisive things. <laughs> that's what exactly she's doing. She was part of the Chiluba administration. Of all the people, she is the one that is at least blessed with good age because she was only in her 30s when she was becoming minister. So by now she needs to show some level of maturity and give us an idea of how best we can resolve our economic situation. She has not benefited from all that. She begins shifting blame. This is the problem that we have. If a person with a senior position like Edith Nawakwe can begin making up lies and shifting blame. Because once she says, because everybody is going to believe that no, she's somebody everybody looks uh, up to and, and they'll begin thinking that what she's saying is true when it's not. Now, you, you, some of you are saying, but, but why, why should it be an issue? It is an issue because our country cannot afford to repeat the same mistakes over and over and over and over. There comes a time at which we must say no to the lies. And we must say it with a lot of passion and emotion and sense. Because Edith Nawakwe, a minister, should be saying we were on the right trajectory. The wealth we are seeing in Elas Chipimo Jr., the wealth we are seeing in all these privatized companies, the wealth we are seeing in Akainde Hichilema, the wealth we are seeing in all these people that uh, bought these companies is right. What we need is to make a much more fair and just society. We need to learn lessons from all these business people. What worked, what did not work. That is the kind of confidence that we need to, to have. If Honorable Nawakwi wants to be and continues to be a politician, she has a prerogative to do that. But one thing she cannot do is to lie and, 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 and pee on Shiluba's legacy. That we are not going to allow. Ukusundira pari legacy ya kwa that we are not going to allow. Chiruba had his own weaknesses. Chiruba had his own problems. But one thing Chiruba did was to open up our country so that it becomes a business-oriented country. For that, we are grateful and we will remain grateful. 
All we needed was leaders that were going to build on that to ensure prosperity for our country. Not leaders, when they fail, they begin looking back to find somebody to blame. In 1991, 1991 when Chilwa became president, he said, I'm going to forget whatever happened. Of course, <laughs> of course, it was a problem, you know. I went to Wapula, Bab Wafia. Of course, it was a problem, but at least I did undergo that. No, we are going to look forward and build our economy, build our country, raise the profile of our people. It was not an easy thing to reorient the people of Zambia from a dependency to independence. It was not going to be easy for Chiluba to change our orientation as a people who were dependent on Kaunda's handouts since the 70s and the 80s to begin now looking at our, the, the entrepreneurial spirit. It was not going to be easy. And then somebody in this government begins looking back and saying that it was all because of Chiruva. What nonsense. <laughs> so, what nonsense. If she wants to be a politician, let her go ahead and be a politician. She she did not get any any votes there. What who, who voted for her? Nonsense. It's true. Okay. Any anyone um uh, wants to say something? We've been talking for about an hour. Eh? So, so to the youth of Zambia, you can spend only one hour. My opinion about how we got where we are. It's not too much. You sit and watch four hours of Nigerian movies. For one hour. Particularly go if you're a because you so number kamuntu kasa mibe pati yo mkwa imwe ba yufi. If you're chidi uo, tu wala chita blemu nuye chai. Mwa sumina no kusumina. It's even worse. Yo, my venal wapula, my summing over if you walk along at Yom Kwai, Udi, the new you. No, don't. Samson Kapaira, a related year shoutishan. Ah, Mujibi. Ah, to Jibrongo. Maji, that's how far I can go. I, that's how far I can go in Kaonde. Eh? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You understand Kaunde? No, no, I've understood a little bit of what you've said because Kaunde, if you feel more than the name of Wakopano. Eh, you move in a quamba, Charoki in a kumwa. Nekumona ki in a kumona. Kabiji, do I end up of Rasan? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, Chisuma. Mm, uh, this is nice. Uh, have you noticed that Kaonde is so nice? Eh? Yeah. Eh? Why don't we listen to more of Kaonde? Eh? Eh, I'm late, Poshan. Wa, wa Musako. Lefred. Mm. Lefred. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, okay, okay. I think that's it. Uh, we can't we can't seem to get uh, uh, anyone here. Okay. Um, this is enlightening. Yes, indeed. Uh, we thank you. Okay, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate. I know you've been very patient. Elias Munsha Facebook page is my Facebook page. Please um, like it, share it. 
I also have a YouTube channel, Elias Munsha YouTube channel. I think we can talk a little bit more there. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. We've got to say bye and uh, see you another time. Thank you.